Praise the Lord. Good to be here. Are you ready? Come on, stretch your hands up and say, thank you, Jesus. Let's get ready to receive. All right. Let's see where we want to. Oh, yeah, book of Acts, if you would, please. Go to Acts this morning. I just want to encourage you. With all the things that are going on, I want to just uh, stir up your faith. Amen. Reinforce. Because as you go through your everyday week, uh, there's different things. And, and because you are, uh, you know, you're natural as well as spiritual, uh, there could be a tendency to yield to your natural man a little more, right? And so you've got to kind of uh, encourage yourself in the Lord, don't you? And the wonderful truth is the Holy Spirit is on the inside of you to help you. Just yield to him and say, Holy Spirit, I need help. Because he's, he's placed there supernaturally by your heavenly father, isn't he? We don't want to go through all the scriptures, but excuse me. He said he'll never leave you or forsake you. He's a very present help. So his, we don't want to give him a job classification, but really his job is to help you. And you need lots of help. You need lots of help. Amen. Uh, people think it's wrong to, to say that. I need lots of help. It's not wrong. It's, all, it's a total expression of faith. Now, when you say that, and you say that because you have so many problems and things, and you're not saying it with a, an expression or a conviction of faith towards God, you're saying, I need lots of help, but you're kind of saying it in a hopeless way. You know what I mean? People say that, I need lots of help, but they're saying it more of a self-pity, uh, isolated, you know, hopeless way. But you and I can say, I need lots of help, Holy Spirit. And the more you acknowledge the help you need from him, the more it will be enhanced, the more you'll receive of him, the more you'll see in your life. Because God only works in our lives to the degree, to the degree that we allow him to. You have to permit him to. Amen. And the devil can't work in our lives unless you and I open the door to him. Right? Now, let, let me clarify this because there's always, you know, um, you know, another perspective and that's this is you know when i said god can't work in our lives but to the degree that we yield to him or allow him uh, god's all the while at work the scripture says to will and do of his good pleasure it says he's all the while at work to will and do of his good, but he needs cooperation he needs faith he needs someone to allow to yield to give him that place right to make that inroad in their heart that's why the scripture tells us in revelation Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And you always see those religious pictures, and the handle is not on Jesus' side. It's on the other side, okay? Because Jesus just doesn't bombard and break into your life and do whatever he wants. Now, many times if people are praying or supplicating or interceding for you, you can see different times in your life where God moved. But that was based upon someone else's faith and prayers standing in the gap making up a hedge for your life, right? Uh, and there are just places where God acts, but I'd say 80, 90, who knows what percentage, but he works in accordance to your trust, your dependence, right? So saying how much help you need from him makes opportunity for him. And you and I got to get to the place where we're just not depending on ourselves, right? There's a lot in life that we have to deal with, but we put some dependence upon ourselves, don't we? in some degree, but we should always be in a place of acknowledging, acknowledging. And, and it's like anything else. The more you lift weights, the more your muscles develop, right? Well, the more that you exercise your faith, your faith will grow, right? And actually the scripture says, bodily exercise profits little, but godliness is profitable unto all things. He just said, he didn't say don't exercise because you always got people that say, hey, you know, you don't need. No, he didn't say not exercising wasn't good. He just said, that's not the fullness of it. He said, uh, uh, bodily exercise, it, it has some benefit, right? But really practicing godliness will bring much benefit. It's profitable unto all areas of life. There's a benefit. There's a return that comes back to you. When you practice faith, amen? So uh, 
by acknowledging the Holy Spirit, the helper, the one called alongside to you, you're going to be benefited much more, aren't you? So acknowledge him in the smallest things, you know. Acts 20. Let's start to read. I'm trying to see. Verse 22. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the word here this morning. We, we trust, Holy Spirit, that you're going to cause this word to resonate, to be illuminated in our hearts, in our minds, cause us to grasp, to lay hold on these truths. And we know that faith comes by hearing and hearing, and that the truths that we already have sown in our heart will be reinforced, they'll be cultivated, watered, and they'll bring forth fruit. The fruits of faith, the fruit of love, the fruit of joy, the fruits of peace, fruits of goodness will be a reflection and an extension of you holding out the word of life in this generation. And so we thank you, Father, that your word never returns void, but it accomplishes where it's sown and where it's sent. And so we thank you this morning, and we trust you that the effects of it will be profound and transforming in our lives. In Jesus' name. Okay, verse 22. And now you see, I'm going to Jerusalem, bound by the Holy Spirit and obliged and compelled by the convictions of my spirit not knowing what will befall me, except the Holy Spirit clearly and emphatically affirms to me in city after city that imprisonment and suffering await me. <laughs> I mean, here's a person that had some serious faith, right? I mean, he was warned and said there's trials, there's imprisonments, there's all kinds of external things going on right now but yet, in his own spirit, he had a deep conviction, didn't he? He says, I'm bound. I'm compelled by the convictions of my own spirit. I'm convicted. How many of you know when your spirit is strong, it can override some dangerous or challenging situations and circumstances that go on? When your spirit is ablaze and burning and has that full persuasion and that conviction. For instance, you sitting in church today <laughs> is a good example. But you yielded your spirit today and overcame that potential risk, right? You arose over it. Glory to God. Your faith is working. Hallelujah. And God's going to reward that here this morning. Amen. And that's what the apostle Paul said right here. So I want you to stop. I'm getting stirred up here. He says, I'm compelled by my spirit, not even knowing what will befall me. Now, I want you to see this because I'm just kind of sharing this little. You and I don't know everything that's going to happen. How many of you know that? But you do know this, that no matter what happens, that God is for you who can be against you. Right? That the Lord is your helper. Come on, Romans 8 tells you that. If God be for me, who can be against me? Right? And Hebrews 12 tells you this. The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. I will not be afraid. Um, I will not be afraid. What's the verse say? What can man do? Let's take a look at that for you this morning, just real quick, and then we'll get back. We got, we got to go somewhere this morning. You ready? Come on, go over to Hebrews. Right there, Hebrews 12. Verse 5, let your character and moral disposition be free from the love of money, including greed, vice, lust, craving for earthly possessions. Be satisfied with your present circumstance situations with what you have. The emphasis is on what you have. What is it that you have? He says, for God himself has said, I will not in any way fail you. That's what you have. Christ in you, the hope of glory. He says, I'll not fail you. I'll not give you up. I'll not leave you. I'll support. I will not, I will not, I will not in any degree leave you helpless, forsake you, let you down, relax my hold on you. Assuredly not. So we take comfort and encourage and confidently and boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I'm not, I'm not going to be seized with alarm. Uh, 
I'll not fear. I'll not be terrified. What can man do to me? Now, let's just uh, dissect that a little bit. This is something you want to put in your arsenal. Come on now. This is what real faith is. Real faith says right here. I'm not concerned and I'm not letting everything else in the, in the world pull me in and pull me out of my faith. He says, but I'm going to, I'm going to declare boldly this, that God himself, God himself has said to each one of us, he ain't going to fail me. He's not going to give me up. He's not going to leave me without support. He's not going to leave me helpless. He's not going to forsake me. I mean, we can start going through scripture after scripture through the word of God and show that in every one of these instances, God is faithful. He says, he's not going to let me down. He's not going to relax his hold on me. Assuredly not. So there's like eight promises right there that you and I could just write down and get up every morning and implement in our lives. He ain't going to leave me or forsake me. He's not going to lax his hold on me. He ain't going to let me down. He ain't going to fail me when the, when the devil and the world and all the trials and adversity and things that are going on out there, you and I, see, your protection and this prompt, these promises operative and working in your life are dependent only upon you. Um. There was somebody the other day, and, they, and an opportunity came. Now, hopefully he listened, but there was an opportunity that came to him last year, and he didn't act on it. So this year, I encouraged him, me and Rich helped him, and an opportunity came again. And he said to me, he said, well, I'm looking for this person. And I said, listen, you're 20-something you're years old. It's time to act. Stop waiting for other people to do it for you. Go ahead and take action and do something. Amen? Take action. Act on the direction, the leadership. When the opportunity opens, walk through it fearlessly. This week, there's always going to be some challenge in your life. This week, at, when I was at work, I had to get up on a scissor lift. You know that a scissor lift is one of those. And man, it was really high. It was like twice the height of this building, you know. And the scissor lift kept beeping, beep, beep, that because it was on unsta uh, uh, unlevel ground. And then I looked down. All of a sudden, I'm just looking around and I'm doing it. But, and my legs are just locked, man. It's like almost like gripped with fear. But inside, I'm like, man, you can't control my body, fear. I mean, like, and I'm like, move these legs. And I'm like, you know, because it, it's very... You know, fear attacks your mind first. It can literally paralyze you. And so, you know, it tried to grip me, but inside I'm fighting. Inside I'm like, no, I resist you. You're not going to, I'm not going to succumb to you. Because if I succumb to that fear, I'm just going to lower that lip and say, I'm not doing it. I'm scared of heights. I'm not going to do it. I don't like it. You know, I'm going to succumb to that. You know, the external situation was trying to, 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 uh, what's, the, oh man, bring me into a submitted, a submission, a mindset of being paralyzed and locked. But man, I had to work through it. And by the time I got off work that day, I was a little exhausted emotionally because I'm fighting against my own mind. You understand that? And the devil. And then I looked down. I have to look down toward the end of the day and I saw all the instructions that are inside of the, the scissor lift and, and it shows it tipping all the ways it can tip over, uneven ground, uh, leaning over, handing things over, don't reach out. And all of a sudden my, my eyes gravitated, which is, that's all good information, but that wasn't the information I needed at that moment when I was in the fight of faith. You know what I mean? When you're in the fight of faith, you need, you need faith information, not the opposite. How many of you understand what I'm saying? And so I just looked at it and I'm like, man, how did my eyes all of a sudden get, because you're, it's easy for your eyes and your attention with the help of your flesh and the devil to draw you over to the problem, to the challenge or what doesn't seem to be. How many times when you're in a crisis does your, unless you cultivate it and train yourself in the spirit, it just doesn't naturally, you just naturally don't look to Jesus. 
You naturally look at the problem. So that's why it's like exercise. You have to exercise yourself. You have to train yourself not to look at the circumstances. You have to train yourself when you're walking through the valley of the shadow of death, not to stare at the problem. You know, a matter of fact, in uh, when the children of Israel were disobedient and fiery serpents ran into the camp, the Lord told Moses, build a rod and put a, and with a golden serpent on it. Right. And he told everybody to look upon that. And whoever looked upon that, the poison and the bite would be neutralized, right? You know how hard it is when all kinds of uh, attack is coming at you, and all of a sudden, let's just say there's a pack of lions running at you, and I just say, and I grab this flag, and I say, look at this flag, and you'll be preserved, and there's a pack of lions running directly at you. You think, oh, just look at that flag. See, the truth is, there, you don't see anything in that flag special, do you? But the reality is, see, it wasn't what was in the pole. It was the act of faith, looking away from the, the danger, the assault, and looking under God's directive. And if God gave direction to look at a flag, look at a plant, Look at a a serpent on a pole, right? That's why you see those serpents on at hospitals, because that's the remedy, right? And that was a type and shadow of the cross, looking away. And that's what John 3 says. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man will be lifted up, right? That whoever would look to him would have everlasting life. So listen, don't be deceived. What you look at is very detrimental or beneficial to you so right here the apostle paul right here uh back in acts and just like me i had to fight it was a fight and just because you choose to look away once doesn't mean it goes away right away how many understand what i'm saying imagine people fighting you know against terminal diseases or situations or and there's all kinds of things you and i are fighting against today you and i are in some fight of faith today you're in some fight of faith. It may, it may be a smaller one or it can be a larger one. But you're going to have to make the choice, number one, you already have the victory. Right? You have to choose. And here's the, here's the difference. You know when people are really stressed out and uh, super challenged? It's because truly they're not looking to Jesus. They're trying to figure out up here how they can get through this situation. Get through this challenge. Well, you get through it with him. The Lord is my helper. He just said, I'll not leave you. I'll not let you down. I'll not leave you without support. I'll not relax my hold on you. So you'll never be, you'll never be able to say, you know, I just don't really feel like the Lord's working in my life. I feel so lonely. See, if you're saying that, that means you've left the Lord. Because the Lord hadn't then relaxed his hold. Yeah, God's faithful. Come on now. Faithful. Everybody say that. The Lord's faithful. He don't relax his hold. Even if you feel like it. You know, how many understand what I said? But see, once again, it's, it's the feeling. The feelings try to bring you into a place of being paralyzed and taken captive. And you and I have to combat that, don't we? With the revelation of who he says he is. Amen. You combat that. See, it's easy to say in church. But when you walk out this door all by yourself. And you watch the news. And you listen to that. And this person talks that. And, and, and you see that. And you see this. Your mind is inundated with a bunch of unbelief, doubt, and fear. That's why Jesus said, let him who have ears hear. You have to choose. Don't expect the world to tell you about God. Don't expect the world to tell you about your father. You have, you have a responsibility is the word I'm looking for, to get to know him. How many of you understand what I'm saying? 
It ain't, no, it's the, it ain't even the pastor's responsibility to grow your faith. You got a responsibility to get into the word, to pray, to spend that time and invest in spiritual things. He that sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap. It didn't say if the pastor sows. Now there's that, you know, if you'll sow some seed and water, provoke one another to love and good work. So there's harvest that comes and there's increase. But the reality is, is, you know, you get what you put in, invest in. Amen. So right here, he says, so verse six, we're, we're back in Hebrews. I said, actually Hebrews uh, 13, six. So we take comfort. How can you take comfort? See, it seems weird for you and I to say, I'm not worried. I'm, I'm serious. Look, I am not worried about COVID, politics, the world. I'm not worried, man. I'm not kidding. Sometimes I want to slap myself and go, dude, you should be more concerned. I'm not concerned about my life. I'm not concerned about it. And someone says, you're out of touch. I'm not out of touch. You could be off this, let's, let's keep it real. You could be off this planet today. What is your life but a vapor, the Bible says. What is your life but a vapor? Why would you try to carry the weight of the world? Now it takes some time for us to get to that place. You know, that's why we got to mature. <laughs> but why would I carry what God already carried for me? How am I going to carry and worry about what I'm going to eat, what I'm going to wear? How I'm going to live? Come on now. Let's go by what Jesus said. Don't have me start preaching. We got lots of Christians all around the world. They're just in worry mode. They're like that little bunny, that Energizer bunny. <laughs> worry mode. Boop, 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 boop. Worry, 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 worry. Worry, fretting, and anxieties. I'm not worried at all. If God needs to send a raven, he'll send a raven. If God needs to drop manna, he'll drop manna. I can tell you this, the, uh, I've never seen the righteous forsaken in a seed begging bread. He is the provider, not just when I got a great job. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Come on now. God's able to take care of his own. I'm the shepherd you shall not want. I can honestly tell you that. Because I just got a job back, but previous to that, I mean, you know, hey, day to day, baby. Faithful, I never missed a meal. I'm telling you, I was eating steak. <laughs> I mean, I'm not kidding. The Lord provides. I know that bugs people sometimes that don't have faith. You know, they say you should be eating top ramen, saving every little penny. I mean, I like top ramen, but, you know, eat whatever the Lord provides for you. Matter of fact, Jesus said when you go to someone's house and they put the food before you, go ahead and sit down and eat it. Whatever the Lord provides, thank him for it and keep moving forward. Don't worry, you'll be fed. The birds are there, so not, nor gather in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. In the air, man, they, they never go, Lord, we ain't ate today. And the, the Lord... The Lord's faithful. Amen. We don't need to care about anything. Cast your cares upon the Lord, he says. Come on now. I'm just, spe just speaking to us and whoever might watch this later. The Lord said, cast your cares. Some people say, I believe it, I believe it. But yeah, but you still carry in the care. The Lord's waiting for you to cast that care. And when you're carefree, you're joy filled. You're peace filled. Carefree. It takes time to cultivate that truth, to be able to say, Lord, you're going to provide for me. Thank you, Father. You know? My job is not to try to integrate every little aspect about how God's going to get something done. It's not my business. My business is like what Jesus said. I'm to be about my father's business. I don't know how God's going to do everything. You, I don't even care personally at this age. Just do what you want to do, Lord. Move how you want to move. Glory to God. 
right? Show yourself strong. Come on. He's ready and willing. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro the earth. The eyes of God, they're looking. Come on. He got big bifocals. He's like, Bling. he's looking to show himself strong. You think, well, I'm, I ain't seen nothing. Just keep walking. Keep praising. Keep speaking the word. Keep serving him. Don't let the devil diminish and discourage you and get you moved away from looking to Jesus. Amen. And it's not about looking to him so you can get a new truck, a new car. house. But it's not about that. It's about you continuing not to ever allow yourself to be discouraged. Not, how can you and I allow ourselves to be discouraged? We have to fight back. Fight the good fight of faith. So he says, take comfort. Now look, let me hurry up because I'm going to get to this other verses. He says, take comfort. What do you mean take comfort? How can I take comfort? You don't know what I'm going through, but I like this promise. I will not, I will not, I will not. I mean, how many times does a person have to say something before you believe it? I mean, for me, it's one. It's good enough. I heard you. <laughs> how many of you know what I mean? It'd be like, you know, somebody telling you, I promise I'll do it. I promise I'll do it. And you're like, it's cool, bro. I got it. I heard you. I trust you. You're good. I mean, you know what I'm saying? You don't have to keep telling, but the Lord has to keep telling this because there's people who don't believe it. So he reinforces it, doesn't he? That's amazing, though. I mean, for God, that's wonderful to know that God's willing to say, I will not, I will not, I will not. There's no way for you to ever think that he wouldn't. How many of you know? He reinforces that. And he says right here, he says, so you take comfort, you're encouraged, and you boldly say, Lord is my helper. I'm not going to be seized with alarm. What does that mean, seized with alarm? That means if something pops up, you're not like, oh, my gosh. Virus. Oh my gosh. You were president that. Oh my gosh. It's a race riot. Oh my gosh. Look it. You remember when Jesus said this? The poor you'll always have, but you wouldn't have me. Is there poor people today? There's still poor people, isn't there? Back to what I said. The Lord is our Helper, take comfort. And now I'm going to get back over to Acts. Let me just finish this last part right here. Okay. Amen. Are you getting anything out of this? He says, uh, I will not be seized with alarm. I will not fear or dread or be terrified. What can man do? What can man do? You know what he's talking about? What can man do to you? He's not talking about your neighbor you have an argument with. He's talking about humanity. You know. So the reality is, is just keep serving your God. Have faith, have confidence. Don't look at the problem. Don't look at the situation. Don't allow the news and the media and everybody else's opinion and fears and worries. Don't be seized. What can man do to you? Go back now to Acts. Let me just cover a couple of verses. I just want to encourage you. Don't look at anything going on right now in the world. And I, want, I would say this. I would say there's probably going to be some more stuff that's rumbled, that the devil rumbles up. Or just, can I, can I just keep it real with you? People overly think, and they paralyze themselves. Humanity, you know? And most of the people that are trying to either run the country or they're in some level of supposed government leadership, look at man. This is dangerous when it's, it's overused. You know what I mean? when it's used too much, right? There needs to be uh, a leading. And so what's important for you and I, and we can't be accountable for what others are doing in governmental places or whatever. You let the Holy Spirit lead your life. I'm not saying break the law, but I'm saying just don't put all your faith in government and everybody else, man. Don't do that right now. I mean, you and I, I mean, keep some confidence, but what I'm trying to say is be led by God's government. Be led by God's government. And God's government is on the inside of you. 
I mean, when it comes time to vote, listen to the Holy Ghost. You know, follow the Holy Spirit. You know, know where to go. Know who to connect with. Know uh, what place you're at. Know who's amongst you. All right? Acts 20. And I know a lot of people say, well, those people, man, I'm not against government. I'm just saying right now is not the time to be just putting all your confidence in, you know, whatever's out there. Put your confidence and faith in the leading of the Holy Spirit, looking unto Jesus. All right? Acts, let me hear it and finish this up. Acts 20. Back over here. Here's what I wanted to get to. He says, compel me. But uh, Acts 20, verse 23. Except the Holy Spirit clearly and emphatically affirms to me in city after city, imprisonments and sufferings await me. But here's what I want to say. Verse 24. But none of these things move me. None of them. Boy, that's a good affirmation, isn't it? Neither do I esteem my life dear to myself. If I may only finish my course with joy in the ministry that I have obtained, which is entrusted to me by the Lord Jesus, faithfully to attest the good news, the gospel of God's grace. Now, here's what he said. I don't count my own life dear. You know what he said? It's what Jesus said. If any man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross. It's the same principle that Paul said. I'm not counting my life dear. I'm not concerned about me. I'm not being cautious about my life, meaning what I want to see. I'm more illuminated, more uh, purposed for the will of God than I am thinking about my, my own life. Now, obviously, he had a higher calling than probably you and I, but you and I can implement some of that truth and that perspective into our lives, that we should not be concentrated on us. What can I preserve in this hour? This is a fine hour for you and I to be an extension of God's power, an extension of God's goodness, an extension of God's love. Amen? Move past all the external things. Jesus said in John 16, in the world, you're going to have tribulation. You're going to have challenges. You're going to have trials. But be of good cheer. I've overcome it. I've deprived it of its power to harm you. So I believe as you and I stay under that classification of faith in his blood, we're protected, we're kept, we're preserved. Amen. We're preserved. Now, let's look at a couple other verses real quick. Go to Hebrews 11. He says, none of these things move me. What is he saying? The same thing we've been talking about. I'm not looking at what's going on externally. I mean, this is some heavy-duty faith. This is the kind of faith that shakes all the hell and scares the devil, right? It's the kind of faith, it didn't mean that he wasn't challenged. Go over to Hebrews, if you would. Hebrews 11. A couple verses and then we'll close it up. Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11. Look at verse 17. Ready? By faith, Abraham, when he was put to the test, when Abraham was put to the test, while the testing of his faith was in progress. I like that. While he was in progress. Would you say you and I or the world is being put to the test right now? I'd say so. There's a test going on right now in the world. People say, well, the government and people are trying to, man, those are all uh, good theories and stuff, but just in general, we're being tested. Our faith is being tested as a as a as a as a, a believer, as a, a a church, as a nation, as a society. We're put to the test. The test is in progress, man. And it says, while his test was in he had already brought Isaac for an offering. He who had gladly received and welcomed God's promise was ready to sacrifice his only son. Of whom it was said, though Isaac will be your descendant, uh, through Isaac shall your descendants be reckoned. Now, here's the interesting thing. He had already said through Isaac, you know, the promise that God gave Abraham. Remember, he said, uh, uh, your seed will be as uh, the numbers of the uh, sand on the, uh, uh, of the sea, uh, so forth, so on, as the stars. And so when he had that uh, birth of Isaac, that supernatural 
uh, birth, uh, now God says, hey, bring Isaac up and offer him as a sacrifice. Do you think Abraham went, hmm, you said through Isaac would come all my descendants and this, and he had that promise of God. And now you're asking me to sacrifice him and give him back? What's going to happen now with that promise? How is that going to be fulfilled? Look what it said. 19, for he reasoned that God was able to raise him up even from the dead. Now that ain't correct. I mean, you know, but that was his reasoning. Do you hear what I said? That that wasn't correct, but that was his reasoning. That he had that much faith and confidence in God, he just thought, if God kills him, he'll raise him up. You and I, from New Testament revelation, know that God would have never killed Isaac, would he? He wouldn't need to kill Isaac and raise Isaac back up. Because there was only one that was going to give his life, and that was Jesus. But he used Abraham's faith as a type and a shadow and as a means, a conduit in a sense, to bring in Jesus through Abraham's faith into the earth. Amen? And so the reality, Abraham reasoned in himself and just thought, okay, great. You'll raise him up. I don't know, your, I don't know how you're going to do it all, but the, the whole point I'm trying to tell you, he had just simple faith. Simple faith was no problem. You'll raise him up. Marched his own son right up there, brought up, and he said, God will provide himself an offering. He had faith. He didn't look at the situation. He could have looked at, man, what do you mean? You're, you're all the fear, and I'm going to lose my son, and what about this? And now you're a liar, God, and you, didn't, you promised me this, and now you're asking me, come on, look at all the circumstances and situations. He had eyes of faith. Verse 20, with eyes of faith, Isaac, looking far into the future, invoked blessing. With eyes of faith. So no matter what's going on, I'm just reiterating again. Let's look at 2 Corinthians now, 2 Corinthians 4. And that's this. We're going to look at two more verses. With eyes of faith. So don't look at your circumstances. Don't look at the COVID. Don't look at the politics. Don't look at the racial stuff. Look at nothing but Jesus. That's it. Look at nothing but from this day forward, just purpose to not get your attention, your focus, or your eyes on anything else but the Lord. Amen? Build into your system, right, that kind of immunity, that kind of strength, that kind of faith. Continue because that's where we're going. As times move on, I don't, I don't see, you know, I, I don't want to say times are going to get worse. They're going to get worse for some people. They're going to get worse for some people, right? We're in the testing mode right now. But those that will stay and hold fast and keep trusting God, they're protected. They're abiding in the shadow of the Almighty, whose power no foe can withstand. Second Corinthians, let's look at this. Second Corinthians chapter 4. And then I'll look at two other scriptures we'll close. 2 Corinthians 4. This is what faith is. Man, that, that'd be a good uh, illustration. Look at uh, verse 8. The Apostle Paul says, We are hedged in, pressed on every side, troubled, oppressed in every way. Matter of fact, I, I'm just, Paul the Apostle says, we're hedged in. And the devil can make you try to feel like you're hedged in on every side, troubled, oppressed in every way. Uh, he says, but I'm not cramped. I mean, he says, there's, there's a lot of Holy Ghost wiggle room here. There's a lot of room here I still got. You may try to cramp me, hedge me in, but God makes room. There's room here. Come on. By faith, he says, right here, I'll show you. He says, we're not cramped. I'm not even crushed. But externally, it feels he like I'm hedged. I I've suffered embarrassments, but I'm, and I'm perplexed. Naturally, I'm unable to find a way out. That's, that's kind of like a good place to be. Now, I know nobody really wants to say that because everybody's thinking, I hope I never get to that place. 
Well, if you are an unbeliever, that is not a place you want to be in. You, you, if you're an unbeliever, you do not want to be in a place where you feel like I am unable to find a way out. But if you're a believer and you find yourself in a place where you say, I feel like I'm unable to find a way out, but I want you to know the Lord will see me through. The Lord is my deliverer. The Lord is my helper. Let's just keep it real. When the children of Israel came to the Red Sea, they felt like they were unable to find a way out. But God had a way out. Remember this. He says he knows the plans he has for us. Plans of good, not of evil, to give you an expected end and a bright future. God knows the plans all the way. So there's always a way out. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. He'll never lax his hold. Just keep looking to him. Don't for a minute flinch. Don't for a minute give way to the thoughts that bombard your mind and your emotions to which then try to seep into your heart and then come right through the portal hole of the eternal place called your tongue. Don't allow an entrance into your life through your words, through your mouth of the enemy's plan. Instead, hold fast, the Bible says, your affirmation, your declaration. Hold fast to saying, the Lord is my helper. He'll see me through. I may feel hedged, but I'm not crushed. I may feel cramped, but I'm not. Um, I may feel perplexed, but I'm not forsaken. I may feel like I'm unable to find a, a, a way out, but God makes a way always. Amen? He says, we're pursued and persecuted, hard driven but I'm not deserted to stand alone. Listen to that. Struck down, but I'm never struck out or destroyed. Now, how do we deal with that? Look what he says right here. Verse 16 now. Read with me. Therefore, we do not become discouraged. Now, listen to this. I'm not saying that the feelings of discouragement and the emotions of discouragement won't try to come over you. They will. As long as you're on planet Earth, there'll always be some devil, demon, or spirit that tries to stream across your mind or your emotions, discouraging thoughts. But the reality is, he says, we do not become discouraged, utterly spiritless. See, see how the devil tries to knock the fight out of you? Exhausted, wearied out through fear. So that's what he does. He tries to break you down, weary you down dismantle your faith so that you stop believing in God and you default back to trusting in yourself, to trusting in the natural things of the world, depending on self-reliance rather than depending upon God, rather than trusting and yielding to him. That's what the enemy does. He tries to wear you down through faith so that you, as I said, when I was on that scissor list, you just submit and succumb to allowing fear to rule you now. But with eyes of faith, Isaac spoke about the future. Come on now. With eyes of faith, what are you saying about your future? What are you speaking about your life? You know what I'm saying? I'm not saying you got to be declaring 20, 50 years down the road. But you should be saying something that correlates with what your heart says. You should be saying something. Long life, you satisfy me, Lord, and show me your salvation. My best years are ahead, Lord. I'm blessed coming in, blessed going out. I'm not going to fail. You never leave me or forsake me. I'm more than a conqueror. I'm expecting you to do great things in my life. I mean, I am. I'm expecting to reach people. I'm expecting to walk in the blessings of God. Not what the world has. I'm expecting God's favor to hit. We keep walking. Our steps are ordered, man. Here's a plan. Why? I mean, if, if I'm not going to trust God, then I should trust myself like the rest of society, which I'm not going to do. All right, let me hurry up and finish. He says, we're not wearied out through fear, though the outward man is decaying. Your inner man is being renewed. For this light, look it, this light momentary affliction, this slight distress of the passing hour is more and more abundantly preparing and producing. Really, all this, let's, let's just, uh, uh, let's keep it real. 
how many of you feel like you've grown during this time of whatever's gone on with uh, in the world during the last, I don't know, what is it, four to six months? How many of you feel like you've grown? I really feel like I've grown. I mean, I, I, I got faith. And by the grace of God, I don't feel like I've ever flinched. I don't feel like I've grown back, I feel, but I feel like I got a better understanding. I, I feel like I have a better understanding. Uh, I, I hold the deep conviction. If, if there's anything I've grown in is if my expectations of Christians is, let, is down. So I, I, I don't expect any Christians to do anything. I don't. I only expect myself to live according to what I believe. It'd be nice if they came along with the word. But I don't expect any believer to live according to God's word. I don't. I let that go. Because it bugged me. When you praise God, he inhabits. And if God walks in this room, I don't care if it's AIDS, COVID, Ebola, this. If God walks in this room, everything dark must leave. Period. When God walks in and steps in through your praise and manifests himself, Everything goes. Otherwise, I don't want to go to church. I'm not at church just to give a lecture and have a little discussion on how to kind of just, you know, uh, intellectually walk with God. I'm here to experience power. I need something greater than me. I mean, because I have a certain uh, certain ability and 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 giftings, but if, if my whole life is going to be lived according to that, then I might as well stop going to church. I need a manifestation of something supernatural to enter in, amen, and invade my life, bring a shift, a transformation, enable me to live at a place that other people can't live at, meaning natural versus spiritual. That's where I want to live. I don't want to live in a base natural life where I'm just doing everything out of my own, you know, self-preservation -pre -pre mode. So he says, here it is. I'll hurry up. He says, this light momentary affliction is producing, preparing, and achieving for us an everlasting weight of glory beyond all measure, excessively surpassing all comparisons and calculations, a vast and transcendent glory, and blessedness never to cease. It's not just for a season. We're going to go from glory to glory, strength thing. Since we consider, we look not to the things that are seen but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are visible are temporal. They're, they're changeable but, and fleeting. But the things that are invisible are deathless and everlasting. Put your faith in the eternal, everlasting word of God. It never fails. Amen? In, in closing, I'm going to read this last verse in, in 1 John 3. 1 John 3. I would encourage you to read Hebrews 6 in the Amplified this week about God's Word. But I want to close with 1 John 3. And I just want to start with this one word. 1 John 3 says, Behold. Behold, 1 John 3, 1. Behold what manner of love the Father's bestowed upon you. When somebody says behold, it means a lot different than just, I saw that. How many of you know, people behold all kinds of things in life. You know, someone gets a piece of gold, a diamond, uh, a, a famous art. You know, there's all kinds of things people behold. They behold their children. We put pictures of our kids on the walls or your marriage or all kinds of stuff. You behold that because there's some value to that. But here's what the Lord says. Behold him. And when you see God, you are transformed. You are changed. There's something supernatural about experiencing a manifestation, visitation, habitation of God's presence. The Amplified says, see what an incredible quality of love the Father has shown and bestowed on us that you are called children of God. See what an incredible, come on now, let's stand up. What incredible quality. Come on now. Don't just see God like everybody else in the world sees church. They go, 
and ask the Lord. <laughs> when you see Jesus, it's a lot different, isn't it? Come on. Just hold your hands up to him. Let's thank God. This, this message was brought to you by Living Water Fellowship San Francisco. You can connect with us on Facebook or email us at sflivingwater.com.